Welcome to the Brian Foltis Behavioral Finance Podcast, where we unravel the mysteries of behavioral finance and unlock the secrets to making smarter, more informed decisions with your money. Now, here's your host, Dr. Brian Foltis. Welcome, everybody, to the Brian Foltis Behavioral Finance Podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about the systematic underestimation of how long we think things will take, things will cost, and the risk involved. Now, how many of you have fallen victim to what we will learn today called the planning fallacy? So, today, we're going to talk about the planning fallacy. Also, hopefully talk about the ways to avoid this or reduce it. I think it's still going to happen, but we're going to try to reduce this. So thank you very much for watching today. I am on the last day of my summer vacation before I go back to class and teach my three sections. I've got two sections of international financial management and one section of behavioral finance waiting for me back on campus. I've got one last day here to record a couple of podcasts and get everything that I've been working on for the entire summer, hopefully over the finish line. Now, of course, there is a, it's not a coincidence that we're talking about the planning fallacy today because I am a firsthand testimony to this fallacy. And it had become a systematic thing where I was like, oh, what is that called? And realized, oh yeah, it's called the planning fallacy. It actually was originated back in 1979 by Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, which you will probably recognize those names as the original founders of behavioral finance. And we talk about prospect theory and they're the ones who created it, but they also created this planning fallacy. And anybody who is in academia, who has written any research papers, realize that this is a very real thing. The planning fallacy is very real. And if you're, even if you understand it and are smart about it, you still fall into this trap. So in my world of academic writing, you have to remember when you're writing an academic paper that it could be 20 pages long and you probably, I'm going to say on average, spend between from first idea to final manuscripts sent through because everything in between, you have to tell the story, you have to do the analysis, set up the analysis, be right about the analysis, and then go through a rigorous process of getting uh, reviewed by your peers in order to get this journal done. And so typically, historically, I've written probably between 18 and 20 papers and publications and can estimate that anywhere from 200 to 400 hours will be spent on this paper that is 20 pages long. And whenever I'm teaching somebody about their honors thesis, we're trying to get them to write an academic paper, I'm constantly telling them, look, take the amount of time that you think it's going to take and multiply it by about 10 because it's not just a normal paper. So anyway, this is coming from Kahneman and, and Amos Swirtsky. And this idea, though, is three facets. We have a systematic tendency to underestimate the time things taste, uh, take, the amount that things cost, and then also the risk involved in this. A lot of these things have ties to optimism. So remember that one time where we made it to work in 30 minutes and we had every light. So now we start thinking, I'm going to give myself 30 minutes in order to get myself to work each day, when in reality, it's anywhere from 42 
to 47 minutes just happen to be a lucky day. But then you suddenly become systematically late because of your miscalibration uh, in your estimate. So that's where it usually comes from. In all of these facets, you have this over-optimism here from that one time or that one day. And it just, because we remember it, we'd like to think about those things, but it messes up our estimations and calibrations. All right, so when we think about how long something takes, I have been working all summer long on behavioral finance content. What I mean by that is I repackaged my entire undergraduate class and turned it into four different modules, which then were recorded as mini courses that are now, as of today, posted online as a resource that somebody can actually go buy. So I've been working on that all summer long, thinking I would have that done in, just give me a week for each module. Week for each module, I'll get it done. That'll take four weeks. So by the time I started my summer in May, and June, then I would get it, I would have it done by June sometime and we'll roll it out. Didn't work that way. And I don't even believe it was for, wasn't because of procrastination. Every step just took way longer to record than I anticipated or could estimate. So we would get chunks done, but it would be one section in a few weeks. And we get back to it. So anyway, the good news is it's all done. The four mini courses are all completed. I spent a lot of time talking to this computer all summer long, and I can't wait to speak to human beings in person starting tomorrow. But anyway, good news on that front, but this was the planning fallacy manifesting itself in my life. And then at the same time, trying to get in and out of doing some podcasts when I wanted to. And sometimes it's this classic overthink where you're trying to produce a podcast and then the perfectionism kind of jumps in and you're like, shit, I don't really like what I talked about. Or I was really doing a, a first glance over this topic and was sharing my thoughts. So it didn't come out great. And so you hold some back and you keep going. And so you start getting in your own way as well. So you've got all of these projects that you're doing and it just will always take longer. And when I speak to students, think about how long it takes to prepare for an exam or to write a paper. And usually you take that number and if we can identify it, we can usually multiply it by three to four times to actually get a more accurate representation. But now in the world of finance, we can think about how much things cost. And this is where our planning fallacy really hurts us in our own budgeting. Many times I see budgets getting written out and they look so gorgeous on paper. And I think in the back of my mind, if you could even execute half of what you've written out, then you are well on your way. But what ends up happening is this particular budget that we all write out each month is based on this perfect situation where nothing comes up, nothing happens, and there are no, no events that cost any money in this particular month. And we expect that to be our monthly budget. So it goes without saying that we're always blowing our budget or we always get really over our budget, especially that first one where we're talking real optimism and we finally have a, a crossroads at that point of, all right, what do I do with this? This is total shit. Like I totally made this budget, but it doesn't work. And so many people get really discouraged to the point where they just go, this doesn't work. I never really wanted to do this anyway. And so they just stop with the actual tracking and the revision of the budget, which is the important part because we know that first, first draft of the budget is not gonna be very accurate and will always shift over time. 
So even myself being 20 years into writing these budgets, understand that, hey, we'll never get this perfect. We're just trying to rein it in and get inside some sort of a range. And even as things shift, you, marriages, kids get older, hey, have a tendency to become more expensive. All these different things continue to shift. So it has to be organic. But many people use this planning fallacy as an excuse to just stop budgeting because it always go over what they've allotted in their budget. And then also risk. When we evaluate risk, we always think nothing could go wrong. There will be no emergencies. Nobody will get sick in any of these scenarios. And so that also filters back to minimizing anticipated costs because it won't cost as much. And then also time because there will be no hiccups involved with the project or the timing of the project, because once again, no one's going to get sick, no other circumstances will come up, and no, no other distractions are going to happen here. And so we take these things, and this is myself here on the very back end of the summer, really trying to think, okay, what happened? You really got that estimate wrong for all of these different projects and services that we were rolling out online and it really wasn't because of procrastination. There wasn't, there weren't many times where I was just sitting there going, I really should do this, but I don't really want to. And I'm just going to go sit out by the pool. And now typically that's been a good excuse in the summertime for me to drag my feet. It just wasn't the case this summer. So you go back and go, okay, what do I do with this? If I know that the planning fallacy is something that is a thing, how do I use this or what do I do to improve around this? And the first thing I would say is hopefully you're seeing my demeanor and my attitude about making a mistake. And it is don't beat yourself up. It's you can't just go, okay, man, I'm a piece of whatever because I can't estimate this or I went way over. And so I'm going to stop my budget I'm going to stop doing projects or something like that. So don't beat yourself up. You have to shrug it off and, and smile and laugh about it and go, yeah, there's the planning fallacy once again, rearing its, its head in my life. But then for me, it's a more of a reflection of trying to recognize what we're talking about here. Oh, wow. I really blew that next time. I'm going to take my own advice when I think it's going to take one or two weeks to get a, a mini course completed. I'm going to multiply that by three or four times so then I can set proper expectations and I have some wiggle room because what ends up happening is the reality when you start a mini course, you've got to, and there's a learning curve around the stupid audio microphones and getting that running. And then there's always a new platform that is running this. And so you're trying to get a, your head around that and you've got lighting and all these things. And I didn't realize that I was going to turn my little home office into Warner Brothers Studios here. But, and of course it doesn't really even look like it, but there were some little things involved that it was just take time and you got to get your head around and you really need to to figure it out in order to put out something decent. So again, not being myself up, but also recognizing we're going to use that principle three to four times, our estimated time. And that way we can set proper expectations because at the end of the day, we don't want to get in trouble all the time with our uh, workplace or our own businesses where we are over-promising and under-delivering. And that's where I would like us to reshift by adding that cushion of three to four times in order to then under promise, over deliver, because we can always be early. And that's what I started learning with my calibration, even with little things, going to work or taking kids to soccer practice where, yeah, that one time I made it in 30 minutes, but what's the harm of giving ourselves extra time in case we get stuck in traffic, which my God, it does all, we do a lot. 
But when you don't hit traffic, there is nothing wrong with getting there early. And there's a sense of, of peace and there's a lot less stress by just making some better estimates around how long and how much things are going to cost. Anyway, I hope that helps you. Definitely was interesting to, to talk about my own summer here and some of the, the, the good news. Come to my stand store. Come check out what I'm uh, offering. There's a lot of cool things out there. Just go to brianfoltis.com and it'll take you to where you want to go just so you can see what's being offered out there. And uh, if you want me to help out your organization, your school, and that's what we're ramping up towards. And we're going to be rolling out some more money strong content and presentations here in this next academic year. I um, can't tell I'm already pretty pumped about it. So anyway, would love to serve you in whichever way possible. I'm happy to now offer products that can also serve you. So anyway, have a wonderful day. Let me know if you need anything in the comments. We'll see you on the next vi video. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Brian Foltis Behavioral Finance Podcast. We hope you found our exploration into the fascinating world of human behavior and finance, both enlightening and thought-provoking. Be sure to subscribe for future episodes. And until next time, stay curious and financially savvy.